So this is an experiment. I've never done this talk before, or rather it's probably not going to be a talk. I'll be uh, drawing a little bit on the board and just throwing around ideas. And hopefully you won't totally tear them apart. <laughs> um, the, the idea behind this talk is that I, um, I've been working with, uh, with domain-driven design for, I don't know, 10, 15 years now. And uh, every time I get into a project where uh, we get to use domain-driven design to some extent, um, most of the time it's about modeling. Most of the time it's about trying to somehow distill the intricacies of the business domain. And that's what I think domain-driven design is about. But on the other hand, uh, very often people tend to use the strategic patterns, patterns just like we use entities and repositories and so forth. Um, the part that Eric Evans described in the first three quarters of his book that uh, he now says people should read after the strategic part. Um, but what I've learned is um, that coming up with a proper working model for your domain is rather hard. I don't know, does anyone else have this experience? Most of the time, uh, when I talk to business people, I have three people in the room, I have at least five opinions. Um, but still, it's, uh, it's up to us somehow to facilitate the coming up with a model. And when it comes to models, the traditional models that we worked with were uh, extremely data-driven. They basically showed how tables work together. And if I look at, at most common implementations, nowadays we still have lots of classes that simply represent data that simply represent tables in a database. And uh, we have this one-to-one -one relationship of, 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 uh, of tables, of uh, repositories, of entities, of controllers on top, and everything looks like data to everyone. And when I sit down with business people, when I sit down with the domain experts, very often they start telling me we need a customer table and we need an um, account table and... Um, an invoice table, for instance. They really think in terms of data because we taught them to. Throughout the last 40 years, we taught, we developers, we IT people taught the business people to think in terms of data, to think in terms of tables and of forms. Because in the past, that was how we built things. And the business people were so desperate to because they wanted us to understand what they need to help solve their problems, that they started learning our language. And nowadays, most business people think in terms of data, think in terms of create, read, update, delete. Domain driven design, I think, set out to change this back again, to go back into what does the business actually need? Because computers, and the way we build systems nowadays allows us to, to model the richness of pretty much every domain. And it allows us to solve actual business problems and not just store data. But we still have to teach ourselves to think in terms of business and not in terms of data and forms <laughs> and relationships between data. Very often we just store state. We have a database and we have the state in the database, but for most businesses, for most business domains, state is not very important. For most businesses, it is important that things happen, like a customer buys something and then they actually pay the invoice. This is important. So be the behavior inside our systems is important. What I would like, would like to do today is um, go the route from basically a traditional model as we used to build them and, and as most are being, uh, still being built today, from a traditional model into what domain-driven design helped, helped us to introduce, into how domain-driven design helped us to reason about our models, um, which also 
had a huge impact on the, on the, uh, on the whole microservices movement because domain-driven design and how to cut my services has many things uh, placed very well together. And then I would like to take the next step because in the recent couple of years, one new concept came up, the concept of serverless compute, where we are actually able to write tiny functions and individually deploy them. And what I've realized in the past is that um, uh, I was watching, who was in Vladik's talk yesterday? Where he talked about that the more you decompose, at some point uh, you get uh, a negative impact, where more of a decomposition leads to, again, leads to more complexity. And what I've seen in practice is that people really start to go down, not only create microservices, but really create what you might call nano services, where every function, every functional unit works as a service with its independent data store and things like that, and that can make things really complicated. What I'd like to propose, or what I'd like to do at one simple example, is to show the way from a traditional model to a domain-driven segregated model to a model how, how it could look like if we would build it with serverless functions. And I'm using, I'm going to use uh, mostly well-known con well concepts because when it comes to, when it comes to microservices, domain-driven design really helps us decompose. And when it, when it comes to serverless, actually CQRS, the command query responsibility segregation, can uh, help us really well to come up with a useful model. That's what I'm going to do today. I hope uh, it won't take too long. If you have any questions, please, just go ahead. This can be an interactive, can be an interactive session. Um, I'm open for ideas. What I'm going to tell you today is not the truth. It's not supposed to be the truth. It's just an idea. It's just an approach. And I'm pretty sure everyone else would come up with a different approach. So, all models are wrong. Some are useful. A statistician said that. Uh, he also said that um, the more you elaborate your model, the more time you put into it, at some point it gets worse again. Like the same thing Vladik said today, um, it's useful, <coughs> it's useful to com come up with a model, but at some point, always, we should go into practice, we should try to implement what we did, to learn from it and to see if, if, it, if it works or if it doesn't. But having that said, I'm not going to show any code today, I'm just going to draw on the, uh, on the flip chart. I was hoping to have a whiteboard, but um, we will have to deal, uh, do with the flip chart. So we'll start out with the monolith. Uh, we do have a simple application. Um, in a university or some kind of school, there are teachers teachers teach classes or courses and there are certain students who want to enroll in these courses. And most of the time in the traditional model we have a teacher we do have a course and every course has one teacher and a teacher can teach multiple courses, or none at all, zero to x, or an, a one to n relationship. And then we have students. Just like in the real world, we have a student, a course, a teacher, a student can be enrolled in zero to, let's say, five courses, and a course can have a defined number, um, a zero to, uh, I'll call it Y, defined number of students because the teacher says how many students are allowed. So we have a piece of information here which is max students. That's one attribute, of course. And this, most of the time, is how it looks in the database. And this is how it looks in our model in our in the in the code base that we use uh, 
usually is a one-to-one -one representation of what we have in the database. Sometimes we do have association tables to represent uh, bidirectional relationships, but that's what it looks like. So we, the course has a maximum number of students. In our code, the course probably has a teacher. It has uh, students, which is a list or whatever kind of collection. The students have their courses. And the teacher has the courses as well. So we have basically we have modeled relationships as they are in the real world based on entities, based on concepts of the real world. What we learned in object orientation, when we learned it the bad way, was every object is like a real thing. And we try to model real things inside of our computer systems. Now we have a few use cases. First, first scenario, a teacher wants to create a new course. He does that by calling some kind of API, uh, or the teacher as the actual person calls some kind of API, and then somewhere we have the teacher object, and the teacher object has a method called create course. And they enter the maximum number of students and the time slot when the course is going to happen every Wednesday from three to five, so we have another attribute, which is the time slot. And then we have a new course with some arguments, and we create a new course, we store the new course, we store the teacher with the new courses and everything, we have a transaction around it. Um, we store the whole unit of work and have basically the rep representation of the state of our system stored back into the database. This is simple, and it usually works. But this, as, as, uh, as soon as you get into more complex systems, you get to that situation where you have many of these tables, where you have many of these relationships. And at some point, I've, I've seen database, uh, database tables and structures and diagrams where you have hundreds of tables and thousands of lines in between, and nobody really understands anymore what's happening. And every time you change something, it affects the whole world. And this is one of the reasons why we came up with trying to segregate. But one of the other reasons is something called language. The teacher probably has a schedule. And the students have a schedule as well. But there are two different things. The teacher's schedule is a schedule of his courses, the courses that he teaches, and also the meetings that he has with staff and whatnot. The schedule of the students is where he can see his courses, the classes, the actual classes where he has to go to. So we have one thing called schedule, but if I ask the teacher, I have a different thing or a different concept than I have when I talk to the student. The student might even not talk about course. The student might be interested in class and not in course. So if you start building a system, a more complex system, you at some point you get to a point where you realize things don't really fit together. If two people talk about a thing with a common name, they sometimes don't talk about the same thing. And that's where we try to, try to separate various contexts. And if I would go into this model and try to separate it into context, I could come up with, for instance, the context of the teacher and the context of the student. The teacher creates courses. The teacher schedules courses. The teacher offers courses, however you want to call it. The student enrolls in courses. Both use basically the same thing, but there are different contexts. 
the teacher's context, the student's context. And actually, the teacher is always interested in all courses that he offers, or she. They are interested in all courses that they offer, no matter if they are full, if nobody enrolled, or whatnot. The student usually isn't interested in any courses that are not available because, for instance, they're full. They're fully booked. The student only is interested in actually available courses. And this is, about, this is something where I could draw a boundary, where I would say, I do have my second iteration. I do have two bounded contexts. The BC course management and the bounded context enrollment or student or whatever you want to call it. This is up for debate, of course, in your specific context. And in the context course management, a teacher schedules the course. And once the teacher schedules the course, we can close the transaction and store it. On the other hand, we may have something similar the available course, because the student's not interested in n courses that are not available. So this is a subset of these. This could look structurally different than this. Most probably, it uses some of the data of this one, but it could also have other pieces of, in of information which the teacher isn't interested in. So we do have an available course, and we do have the student. And the student enrolls in an available course. Underneath, we could still have the same common database with our relationships and have our projection through what Eric Evans called in his book a repository, not the Fowler repository, where you simply have um, have a collection-like interface on top of data, but uh, the Eric <coughs> Evans repository, the domain-driven design repository, where you have an actual translation of data, of structure, into something business-related. <coughs> so we could have the same database underneath with the same relational structure underneath, but in the repository where we load the teacher and the course, we might create new objects that look different than the tables that we have in the database. The same on this side. So we only have the available courses over here. And the student can enroll in the course. And once a student enrolls in a course, everything's uh, stored, and we have the common state inside our database. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? I hope it does. doesn't work. Put it down here. Now that we do have bounded contexts, two of which for now, we could do the next step because we might want to be able to independently evolve these contexts. We might want to be able to independently deploy these con contexts. We might think about not only having conceptual boundaries, but also create technical boundaries along the same lines. And that's where we go into something, maybe a kind of service-oriented architecture, maybe a microservice architecture, where we say we have the two contexts, each of which has their own data store. So we get rid of this common database, which would mean we... I'll, I'll simply take another page. which would mean we have the teacher and the course 
and we have the available course. And the student. Just like before. But over here, we have some kind of representation in, in a database, as well as over here. And once the teacher publishes a new course, we store this information down here. And because the teacher published a new course, we do have a new available course. And I need a way to get this information on the other side, into the other service. And one of the most common ways, especially in domain reunion design, is to create something called a domain event. Something that happened from a business point of view, something important happened, and can be communicated to the rest of the system. For instance, as a message. As a message that we put on some kind of transportation mechanism, and every other context that is interested in every new, newly published course could pick up this message and do with it what they want. So this message could lead to a new available course, which is being stored in this database. And once the student enrolls in a course, the same thing happens. Maybe the teacher wants to know how many students en enrolled in the course. And because we do have a maximum number of students, we want to take care of not overbooking a course. So the course has this maximum number of students. Whenever a new code, a course is being published, um, we can create a new available course. Whenever a student enrolls, we, for instance, can make this, uh, we can also make this explicit because the enrollment is an actual concept in our domain. Why not use something called enrollment? Representing this relationship. And we could then say a student enrolls in the available course and creates an enrollment, which is being stored. And the creation of this enrollment is an actual business event. It's a domain event. It's something important that happened inside our domain. So this, again, could create a new message, put it on some kind of bus or queue. And the other bounded context that's interested in this enrollment could pick it up and realize, oh, we have a new student. So it makes here student number plus one. And it maybe realizes now the course is full. Once it realizes that the course is full, it does not want any more students to enroll, so it shouldn't show up as an available course anymore. That's when I, um, let's say the course is full. We send a message, course is full. And this picks it up again. And as you can see, we have a very complicated model for a simple interaction. This very often is a sign of, excuse me? Yes, please, um, you get a microphone. So for this particular example, I would say uh, if you put the um, part of deciding that the course is full um, on the right side, uh, right. then you avoid a lot of uh, interaction between both sides. So actually it's probably put in the wrong bounded yes. context. Right, exactly. That's. It's a very good point, that's what I was getting at. This is a sign that my boundaries could still be a little off. So why don't I put the information on this side, the number of students in the course, and once I do that, uh, the interaction between the two systems would, would be that the course is being created, so we have a message, adding a new available course. 
And this new, newly available course knows how many knows the max number of students. So that's an attribute in the new in the available course. And I mean, it's the same thing when the student. Uh, no, never mind. Um, so we create a new available course, and the available course knows the number of students, and we can ha have the whole enrollment interaction on this side until the course is full. And all this bounded context needs to do is report back whenever there's an actual enrollment and once the course is full. So we only have unidirectional uh, communication until the enrollment process has finished. So we still do have messages, but it's less complicated because I don't have something like some kind of a distributed interaction, some kind of a distributed uh, transaction, basically, where one context changes state, the other context has to check if the state change leads to another, uh, to certain constraints, uh, constraints and so forth. It still is various messages being sent back and forth, but it's much less complicated. Yes, please. Um, but if you move all the other bounded context, uh, I think you also have. Also, uh, but if you move all in the one uh, bounded context, I think you also have to um, pay attention that you don't have circular dependencies. Yes. But otherwise, uh, yes. If both know each other, then um, it will also be a big ball of mud and nothing uh, is win. Right. Who wins? Right. I have to be aware of the f of the process that I'm trying to model. Yes. I have to be aware of the process and I have to somehow codify the process and take care of mm -hmm. not creating basically endless loops. Thank you. Yes. So this would be... I would move the boundaries a little bit. I would, I would put some, some, some pieces of information into another, uh, into another bounded context. I try to come up with a model where... Uh, the interaction works and it's not too complicated because the more complicated the interaction, the less likely it is that we realize when we have an issue like what you're talking about. Yes. But what we do in this case, no matter where we draw our context boundaries, what we do have is um, a separate persistence layer for each bounded context. And we do have an explicit way of modeling business-related relevant interactions. So we do have domain events. We also might have technical events in there. I'll come to this point in the next iteration. The next iteration would be... What if we want to break down this still inside uh, uh, the bounded context, still monolithic application. Every context is its own small monolith, and they communicate with each other through events, through messages. Um, what if we would try to further break this down? Because we want, for instance, to build a serverless application where we use serverless functions and don't want to run a full-blown um, stateful application. This is where another concept comes into play that I found very helpful in the past and I find even more helpful when thinking about serverless applications and this is CQ, uh, CQRS. Um, who does not know what CQRS is? Ah, well, it's a bad question because nobody wants to tell what they don't know. Um, <laughs> um, the command, command query responsibility segregation is an architectural approach where you, uh, where you basically say, uh, I have two different concerns in my application from a very high-level point of view. One concern is changing something something happens and this something happening, happening needs to be represented in some way. So the writing into the application, the mutation of state, 
And on the other hand, we have a separate concern, which is retrieving information, which is reading information, which is showing the actual state of the, the application. And in CQRS, um, we basically say we have commands like schedule course. And then somewhere we have our application with our domain model, with our objects and what we need. And this command is being played against this application. And underneath we have some kind of data store representing our data. So once a command is being issued, the the objects that I need to process the, the, the command are being loaded from the database or from some kind of data store. The command is being issued, business rules are being applied, and the result is being stored back. But at the same time, to retrieve the actual state, to retrieve the information, I have some kind of very thin read layer that somehow accesses this information. Most of the time what we read is very flat, it's very data oriented, it's very structured. We have a list of classes, we have a list of available courses, we have a list of students or we have course details. These are, uh, this is static information, it's flat information that we basically can just pull up from the database. Or maybe if we go a step further, um, we create, once we store it into the database, once we store what's happening on this side, we create some kind of projection for the various read use cases that the read layer um, then accesses. And the user, the student, looks at the list of available courses this way, then they have the available course, look at the details of the available course, get it from the other table or data store, and then they issue the command enroll in course. And then all the logic appears, like uh, is the student overbooked? Is the course overbooked? Are there conflicts in the schedule of the student? So we have, might have overlapping courses and so forth. So all the business rules are being applied and Finally, we come to a result which is being stored, which might again lead to a, the fact that the course is full. And in some way, we make sure that it disappears from the, from the list of available courses. This basically is CQRS, the Command Query Responsibility Segregation. And if, if I want to refactor my old model, this one, into a CQRS application, into a CQRS-based application, I could simply say, I do have a command. The command is called create course. And I could have an actual API, something something slash create course, which takes query parameters or a body or whatnot. So I could have a representation of this command on my API. And this representation on the API could lead to the invocation of a function called create course. And this function, we are inside the, the, the class management, the course management context. This function it does what is necessary to um, store the information in some kind of data store, which still could be relational. So we have the new course, and once the course is created, we emit an event. And the other bionic context can pick up this event and decide, is it important for me? Can I do anything with it? And it might. The one picking up this event could be a listener on top of the, of, 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 uh, of the mechanism that we use to, to, 
distribute events. Could be on top of a bus, for instance, SNS in AWS, the simple notification service. So we do have another function called um, add available course. And this function is being invoked whenever a message course created is being published. So this function is not being called through the API. It's called internal or it's being invoked internally whenever a specific message is being emitted. This add available course updates state inside our database. On the other hand, yes, please. So why are you call it function when it has side effects? Uh, in this state, you already call it a function, and I see it has side effects. How it differs from the former approach, where you also send a message over the boundary? Over the boundary. Uh, in terms of communication, it does not differ. In terms, what I do, what I do is I decompose uh, an application into separate isolated functions. Functions not in terms of functional programming, but in terms of serverless compute. In terms of Lambda functions in AWS or, um, or Azure functions. So uh, in my opinion, um, uh, the functions that are uh, serverless compute functions, functions as a service, um, should be distinguished from a functional approach in terms of functional programming, where I reason about uh, what side effects do I have and so forth. So what I do here is I, I decompose a monolithic application into separate functions that can be run independently, that can be deployed independently of each other. But I still, of course, need the communication inside the system because the different parts of the system still have somehow to stay in sync to take care of the all overall systems. Does that answer your question? Okay, great. So I do have an available course, and I do have some kind of representation in there. And this might even lead to another event of interest to some other parts of the system. But I'm going to omit this here. What I'm going to, uh, uh, the next step for me would be I. Uh, have the student, and the student en enrolls in one of these courses. And there again, I do have some kind of API enrolling course. I can't read that. I can't read that myself either. So this enrollment again takes data from the database. This command is being issued. And the enrollment leads or might lead to a state change. And this state change, again, can lead to a message telling the world that the number of students in this course has been increased and maybe that this course has been fully booked. So I have various possible messages and multiple, it could be multiple messages. It's not only one message every time. That's what Vladik uh, talked about yesterday as well. Very often you have, you have one event, uh, you have one command, and you could have multiple events. Or was it Vladik or somebody else? I'm not entirely sure right now. Um, one event, uh, one command can lead to multiple events. It could lead to different events. So this uh, a student enrolling in class could lead to the event a uh, new enrollment happened or has been created and the event uh, course has been fully booked. Um, let me think it just a second. Yes. And what we did here, the refactoring that we did here, is one part of what CQRS helps us with. We have introduced commands. Oh, 2M. So we have, we have um, taken the intent 
of the user and put it into something explicit, created an explicit concept for the intent. So inside our domain model, maybe we don't even really have something like a course anymore. It could be that this command simply operates on this data. But if I have complex business logic, I still might want to um, create my model to operate on it. So the very important notion here is, um, in very simple cases, we could come to a point where some of our functions don't need to create a full-blown object model, don't need to create a full-blown domain model to operate on. Many functions are very simple. One example would be, one example would be in HR. Let's say you have an HR system. Most of the time you have ma master data management, you have your form on top of the employee data, and once a, an employee has married and their name changes, you go into the master data and you change the name, and you change the tax class, and you change insurance details or whatnot. So you have the process inside your head, you have the form in front of you, and you change the data, you modify the data. Actually, a well-built and well-modeled application would take this burden off your shoulders. I would like to say to an application, Mrs. or Miss Kramer has married and her new name is Schultz. And I want the system to know and to ask me about the new name, about if the tax class has changed, if security details have changed, and if I want to send flowers or a congrat congratulations card. An HR system that would know about its domain, human resources, should probably know about relationships. If something happens, if, if an employee gets married, some things probably do change. But if I have a typo in my system, and I want to change the last name of Ms. Kramer because I just had a typo, I don't want all this interaction. I just want to correct the typo. So these are two very different things, two very different intents from a business point of view with basically the same result. And in traditional systems, we don't distinguish between the two. We just have a form on top of the data, and we change the data. And I, as a user, have to remember that in case of, uh, of a marriage, I have to change the tax class as well. What I'm trying to say is that once we start decomposing our system for many use cases, we don't need a full-blown domain model, especially when it comes to correcting typos in master data. So I could have function that help me do just that. But I could also have functions that represent a whole business interaction with all its details, with all its rules and constraints, which helps me to not have this one big architecture where I have to load everything into memory and create objects from it and then work on it. But I can, for very simple cases, many, and there are many very simple cases in most applications, I can just have a simple function that uh, simply procedurally operates on top of my data. Yes, please. So I totally get your point why um, CQRS could be a good option to decompose the system there. Mm -hmm. uh, what I don't get yet is, um, so when you're coming from a monolithic application to a microservices architecture, a typical reason for that is uh, organizational um, background. So mm -hmm. your company grows, you have multiple teams, you want to actually make them more autonomous. Mm -hmm. What exactly is the motivation to do this? Um, actually, why should I decompose my bounded contacts even further? Um, actually, the bounded contacts and the resulting microservice should already, already be small enough to fit at least in a team. So what happens here? Responsibility of a single person for a function? Or what is, uh, so what is the motivation, actually? Why should I do that? Mm, that's a good question. Thank you. Um, 
you, there is no you should, of course not. You can. And in some cases, uh, the reasoning could be, uh, it could be different things. I would not say do it because then you have one person responsible. So basically, you, you break down responsibility into even smaller unit. The team should be responsible for the, for the whole service or the whole context. Um, but a reason could be because we don't want to run idle servers all the time. We want to use serverless functions as a, as a utility for our application, uh, maybe because we want to try it out, maybe because it's, uh, it's more economic, because uh, I don't have to run, run idle servers. Um, maybe it's because many, many parts of my functionality are really simple, and I don't need a full-blown Spring application or a full-blown uh, whatever application that's running all the time. So there's no you, no you have to, there's no you should. There is, uh, what I'm trying to do here is, if you want to, then this might be a reasonable approach. It could be, I still don't know, you tell me. But um, this could be a way to further break down, to further decompose. But what you should not do, in my opinion, is start to create functions each with its own data store and then you have all this the communication because then you get to what uh, what Vladik was talking about yesterday where you have this complexity cur complexity curve going down the smaller your components get and at some point the complexity goes back up again and it goes way up at some point Does that answer your question okay thank you so this is the first part of of CQRS where we introduce commands and we, we codif codify, we make explicit the intent of the user, which could be, um, in the case of a marriage in an HR system, which the fact that somebody has married and the system should do things, and we might even not know what rules are being applied in the background, but we know the intent. Somebody has married. Or the intent could be, uh, we had a typo that we needed to fix, which is a completely different use case. And it could be modeled and programmed much simpler than the actual business case. In the case of our example, the teacher creates a course. He might not even want to publish it when he creates it because he, he wants to do course details and reschedule and everything. And at some point they say, publish course or make available, which is an intent, which then leads to the main event, which can be picked up by the other bounded context, that then says, oh, once there is a new available course, I want to have it in my list. Take it, put it into list. That's it. That's all. And the next time the user, the student, comes and looks at the available courses, he just sees the new one and then interacts. The second part of CQRS, and that would be another refactoring, the second part is the view part, where we segregate the view. I, uh, where we basically go from here, where we have a common database, and we have a read layer on top of the database, where we actually start projecting the state into separate views for separate use cases. That would mean that we don't store inside of a relational database, but we store once a course is being created, we just add it to a list of courses, which could be in a simple key value store. And we add it into course details, which could be a simple key value store. And whenever a teacher wants to see their own courses, they call a function, a very small, very tiny function, which does nothing but get the list of courses from this table or from this store, filters it by the teacher, and returns the result. 
This is a very simple, very tiny function. All it does, all it does is take care of retrieving the data. And this is what I called on this slide the thin, 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 that's a very important point, thin read layer. And if the teacher wants to look at the course details, I have another endpoint with another very thin function which does nothing but get the course details and return it to the user, uh, to the teacher. The same on the other hand, I don't have a database, I do have available courses. I do have um, available course details. And I might have enrollments. Which are, again, tables. And I could also have a data store which represents the schedule for the, for the individual student. And their actual schedule so that they can just retrieve the classes that they have during the week. That could be another simple representation of data that is needed. This also could be a completely different context because enrollment is a context different from when I actually go to class. I'm in a different situation. I, as a student, am in a different context. So this is something where I could at least think about drawing another boundary. Or maybe not. So what we do have is a collection of functions around a number of independent tables. Some of these functions are being called through an API by a user. Some of these functions are being invoked whenever a specific message arrives. Some functions might invoke each other. Some functions might be invoked once something is being stored in this table. And this thing all together would be our microservice. There are various questions. What if the models go out of sync? What if for some reason, and this happens, uh, messages get lost, errors occur, some things just don't work out. That's how it happens. So our models will go out of sync. What can we do? First, the first very important question, and we talked about it yesterday. Is it really important? Does it matter if some things go out of sync? That's an important question. We as, we as, we as IT people, we as software developers, very often think in very strict terms of transactions and everything has to be right and correct and consistent, sometimes it doesn't need to. But if it needs to, then we could think about uh, a separate service which might uh, every night, every 24 hours, go through our data stores, takes for everything, takes the single source of truth for this piece of information and synchronizes it through all the pro projects, projections that we have. So the course details would be the single source of truth for our courses and the available courses take their information from there. So if the these two go out of sync, I would have a service that looks into the course details and synchronizes the current state into the downstream projections. Oh, excuse me? Yes. So you're talking about the data, yes. not the models. Actually. I'm talking about the data. I'm talking about how to keep the data in sync. Because in a dis distributed system with distributed data, you have issues with consistency. What, w what happens if at some point in time we have the system running and then we come up with an idea, we need a new view based on existing data? And that, which could be a challenge because uh, we might have had things happening in the past that we did not retain and we cannot create a new view from the old data, or we might want to, we might want to 
replicate things. Or for instance, this, database, this table gets lost for whatever reason. How can we recreate this table? We might need information from the past. We might need to be able to replay past domain events. And this is where an event lock comes into play. So in addition to our databases, we just have somewhere we just have a list of all the events that have happened. And we can replay these events. And if we want to take this to the extreme, we get rid of our of our databases. We only have our views and we have something called event sourcing. There were a couple of talks about event sourcing at, at this conference. It's a concept that I won't get into now because I don't have the time. But this is something that plays very well with all these other concepts, where we actually create our domain model from the number of events that have happened, just like my bank, like in my bank account, my current, my current um, um, balance is just an aggregation of all the past transactions on this account. So I could always get to my current balance by just summing up all the past transactions. And I could also create my domain model, uh, my domain objects in this way. Another consideration, how to transmit data between services. We could send messages back and forth. But what if I have a piece of information in here that is so large that my messaging system breaks? For instance, if I use uh, SQS, in AWS, the simple queue service, I have a limitation on the size of messages. So I might need to think about, do I want to have the payload as part of the message? Or do I want to have a pointer to an API where the downstream service could get the actual data? Call it in a synchronous way. These are considerations. These are things that we have to think about. Another one, well, what if during the process something goes wrong? What if I have multiple steps as part of a process and something doesn't work for a technical reason or for a business reason? I might have to implement a way to roll back, to undo. And this is where the saga pattern comes into play, where a process manager comes into play, where, for, for instance, on AWS, you could use something like step functions or a full-blown process engine. These are things that we have to think about. I don't have any definitive answers because this is always things that you have, just have to think about and come up with ideas how to solve them. I've got a few heuristics. One of them, the one I showed you before, all models are wrong. It's just that some are useful. Don't model the real world. Just because we have all these relationships, between things in the real world, we don't need to model all the relationships inside our objects. We don't necessarily need the list, the actual list of students inside our courses. Maybe it's just of concern how many students are being enrolled, have been enrolled. So all the relationships of the real world and the objects of the real world don't need to be modeled. We want to model interactions. We want to model behavior. We want to model responsibilities. We want to model things that happen and are of importance. Don't model state. Model what actually happens. Because this is important. If I'm a company, if I'm a company, I don't care about the fact that somebody ordered something from me uh, the, in terms of I have this order. I care about the, f the fact that he is ordering so, so that it happens. I, I can't, uh, I'm struggling right now how to say it. Uh, state is useless. Things that happen are useful. We just need state to be able to determine what to do when something happens. And we need state to look into the past and report what happened. But what's actually important is why things happen, intent, and what actually happens, events. And the last one, just as you don't marry, usually don't marry the first person you meet, don't 
use the first model that you come up with. Don't overdo, don't over-architect. I know we tend to do either or, but don't use the very first model you come up with. Think about it, reason about it, iterate over it, over time. And if you realize, I have something seems very complicated here, something seems odd here, or you have two people in the room talking, using the same word, but apparently talking about a completely different things, go in and think about, this might be a sign of you still being able to refine your model. And that's pretty much, pretty much all I wanted to say. Thank you.